Hi, can you hear me well? Great. Well, good morning. It's really a pleasure to be with you today. And I'm really grateful to have this opportunity to talk to you about exoplanets, planets that orbit other stars than our Sun. I'm going to focus on TRAPPIST-1 for quite a bit of the talk. And at this stage, you may wonder why beyond space. Well, actually, this was my line initially, but now I realize that this idea of new perspective has been discussed by the two previous interlocutors. So um, exoplanets are essential for two reasons. Actually, no, let me back up a bit. <laughs> Things have changed now that I heard you speak. Um, there will be two takeaway messages that I want to share with you. First, that exoplanets and exoplanetary science is happening now. We've started to discover planets around other stars only 20 years ago, and now we're already discussing about this idea of diving into the atmosphere, searching for signs of habitability, signs of life. So if you want to dive and join this venture, just come on in, it's really happening. We're building new facilities, we're studying the atmosphere as we speak, and these two big steps, searching for signs of habitability, signs of life, we're aiming for this in the next decade, in the next generation. And then the other step that relates to beyond the cradle, beyond our Earth, beyond our solar system, relates to this new perspective. Our understanding of planets and planet formation really has been based for centuries on one unique sample, the solar system. And ever since we've started to find other planets, we've been obtaining different points in this parameter space of planetary system, planet evolution, planet formation. And now what we want to do in this idea of beyond the cradle is to leverage this different perspective as new vantage point to shift our understanding of planetary system and life beyond them. So let's talk a bit about TRAPPIST-1. TRAPPIST-1 was found using a prototype telescope of only 60 centimeters located in La Silla in Chile. This, is, this was designed and set up by a Belgian team, hence the acronym TRAPPIST. And as you know, in May 2016, our team announced the discovery of the three first Earth-sized planets that have this winning combination of being Earth in size, temperate, so potentially habitable, and amenable for in-depth atmospheric study. And the, th the third last point really is the most essential one. How have we found this planet? We found this planet looking for this tiny flux drop that happens when something is passing in front of a star. We don't see stars. We don't even see planets. They are so far away that all the light coming from one planetary system is condensed in one bright dot. And the brightness of this dot changes when something passes in front of it. Now, what's essential here, and that relates to this third point I talked about, this amenability for in-depth study, is that the flux drop relates directly to the planet-to-star area ratio. Or in other, so, for that reason, the smaller the star, the larger the planetary signal. TRAPPIST-1 is one of the smallest stars we know. It is about 10 times smaller than our Sun, meaning that the signal of a planet in front of it is about 100 times larger than what it would be in front of our Sun. And just for reference, TRAPPIST-1 is about the size of Jupiter. Now, this discovery of the three Earth-sized planets was, as you know, just the beginning. The scientific community was so excited that we managed to initiate a worldwide effort ranging from X-ray ultraviolet to search for atmospheric escape, down to radio to search for signs of magnetic field, and also work with the SETI people to search for other kind of signal. Now, one facility that we use in particular, and you heard about this two weeks ago, is the Spitzer Space Telescope. The reason for that is that this facility, which is on an earth training orbit, can look at any system, at any star, for a continuous amount of time, which is very different from what we can do from the ground. From the ground, you have visibility windows of a few hours for a given target just because the Earth rotates, and then you have the weather that comes on top of it, etc. So once you find a system, the way to go is to convince NASA to provide you with one of these beautiful facilities to just stare at it for a long time. And that's what we did by the end of September. We used Spitzer to look for 20 days in a row at this system. Half through this 20-day monitoring, we get the first data set. Data set that shows something ridiculous. <laughs> Not three, but way more planets. So we had to cheer with the Trappist beer, obviously. And then four months later, we finally got <laughs> to DC for a press conference to announce to the public that this is what had just happened. You're having a telescope about the size of the Earth. No, just kidding. <laughs> Spitzer. We looked at the system and found not one, not two, not three, but actually seven Earth-sized planets. 
got super excited, shocked at the beginning, but happy to share this exhilarating news with you guys. Now, seven Earth-sized planets. Seven Earth-sized planets that are temperate, so potentially habitable, terrestrial, apparently, and that we can study in great depths. Again, the third point means that the best is yet to come. There are way more planets to be found like this, and we need to spend a lot of time searching for them, and then we can characterize them. Why do we need to spend so much time searching for them? Well, because so far there is only this tiny prototype telescope, TRAPPIST, that is amenable to search for such planets. But fortunately, it's a prototype. A prototype for a project called Speculos. Again, Belgian initiative, hence the far-fetched acronym that comes up with a Belgian cookie name. <laughs> And this facility is composed so far, or will be composed, of four one-meter-class telescopes to be placed in parallel. This telescope will look for planets like TRAPPIST-1 around the 500 brightest ultra-cool ultra dwarf star. These stars have been chosen as follow. If we find a planet that's earth side there, we have the capacity with upcoming observatories to study the atmosphere in great depths. And now the emergency in this venture is to make sure that we find all of these Earth-sized planets in advance so we can triage them and pick the one we want to actually spend the time on with upcoming facilities. I'm flying tomorrow to Chile because we're commissioning the two first telescopes of Spiculos, Ion Europa. Two others will be coming in a few months. Now, this is for the southern hemisphere. What about the northern sky? Well, <laughs> now that we got everyone's attention, we've started a fundraising campaign. Here at MIT, we've started this initiative, New Worlds, New Perspective, to bring, well, first to acquire a facility, but also to bring MIT on board of this European consortium, Speculos. I'm happy to let you know that we've already raised $600,000. We're looking for an additional 400K or more to get one telescope or more, we need four up there in the northern sky to complete the work, to complete the depth work as soon as possible. Great. So that's about more planets. And then the step that we're all looking for is to characterize them. Search for signs of atmosphere, signs of habitability, signs of life. The way to do so is to use transmission spectroscopy. Now what it does it looks at how the light coming from the star passing through the planet's atmosphere is affected by it. If you look at different wavelengths, the atmosphere will be opaque, transparent. So in some cases, this thin atmospheric annulus will contribute to the flux drop, meaning that the planet or the flux drop will be slightly larger. The planet will appear slightly bigger. Here is an example of transmission spectrum, as we call them. You have the flux drop as a function of the wavelengths between 1.1 and 1.7 micron. The example in red, let's focus on the red one. These are synthetic data for the red uh, signal. This is a molecular feature of water at 1.4 micron that leads to the flux drop to be about uh, 6,000 parts per million larger than what it is at 1.25, for example. So the atmosphere will be transparent at 1.25, but opaque at 1.4, meaning that there's this additional flux drop of about 6,000 uh, ppm. The essential thing to realize with this graphic is it really is a step-by-step -step process when you do atmospheric characterization. You search for a uh, pl planet atmosphere looking first at the one that are extended at puffy. Extended at puffy is the case when you have a very light element. If you have hydrogen-dominated atmosphere, it's pretty light, so the atmosphere will be extended. As you go down to heavier mean molecular mass, which will be new on this tiny equation, <laughs> the atmosphere becomes thinner and thinner and thinner because the density is higher, so the atmosphere is more compact. Meaning that it's way easier to search first for hydrogen-dominated atmosphere, and then you can push harder with your facility, be down the nose, to a point where you can reveal the thinner atmosphere. Now, what's exciting about this is with facilities such as Hubble, which was designed way before we <laughs> started discovering exoplanets, we're already able to study the TRAPPIST-1 planet. Actually, in May, just two days after we reported the discovery of the planet, I was using the Hubble Space Telescope to provide us with the first insight we had ever gained into the atmosphere of, this, of such planets. 
And this was an amazing data set. So on May the 4th, not only is the planet, <coughs> two planets, the star, but also Hubble were perfectly aligned to provide us with this like, insane data set. In gray, you have the occultation window. Hubble being on a Earth, well, on a lower Earth orbit, it cannot look continuously to one given point. And you can see that these occultation windows are surrounding perfectly this peculiar event of TRAPPIST 1c passing in front of the star and then followed by TRAPPIST 1b. By using this data set, we managed to show, back to this transmission spectrum, data being the uh, black dot with a one sigma error bar, that it was relatively flat to what we would expect in red if the atmosphere of the planet were hydrogen dominated. Meaning that we need to push forward to look for something that would be slightly thinner, but still within reach, something like a water dominated atmosphere or methane dominated atmosphere. Now, what about the other planets, right? <laughs> we know there's seven. Well, as soon as we realize that there are more planets, we shout to NASA again and set up this other program. Managed to convince the uh, Hubble director to observe D, E, F, and G between December and Jan, just before the visibility windows of the system closed till later in May. And we got this. Four visits, each of them capturing two transits of D, E, F, and G, allowing us to get the same insight into the planet atmosphere. So this first step towards characterizing the atmosphere of the planet, searching for hydrogen-dominated atmosphere is basically done. What's next, as I said, is to push harder. We can leverage Hubble's capability to start to find atmosphere that actually would be habitable. One key point that I haven't said here is that these hydrogen-dominated atmosphere, which are the primordial atmosphere, as we call them, they wouldn't be habitable. So it's actually a good thing that we didn't find a sign of them. Hydrogen is a very powerful green, uh, greenhouse, has, greenhouse gas. Sorry. <laughs> and not finding it, it's good for us. It's good in the context of searching for other habitats. And now what we want is prepare this treasury program, a treasury program with Hubble, which will hopefully within the next two years provide us with this insight that there is an atmosphere around one of these planets, an atmosphere that's either water or methane rich. It is really important to do this in this context of triage, right? As I said, there are quite a few planets to be found, and it's good to know which of them we want to focus on to play with this facility. The James Webb Space Telescope is going to be launched in October 2018. It has an aperture that is about six times larger than one of Hubble, and it actually is designed to do the kind of science we want to do in the field of exoplanetary science. But James Webb won't be alone on this journey. We're going to have the extremely large telescope with collecting array ranging from 30 to 40 meters, meaning that these facilities will, lead us, will provide us with exquisite data quality, signal-to-noise ratio unprecedented also a high spectral resolution, meaning that the molecular feature I showed you before, rather than being poorly sampled, will be really finely sampled, allowing us to understand, to constrain, what is the temperature at which these molecules in the atmosphere are absorbing the light, what pressure level. And then they're also going to provide us with extended spectral coverage, meaning that we're going to get this kind of spectrum, showing us lots of different molecules rather than just this tiny bit as I just showed you before with Hubble. So we're really going to obtain a completely different level of understanding of this atmosphere. This is in this context that I want to I emphasize that beyond the search for life, search for signs of habitability, search for signs of life, biosignature, there really is a tremendous potential through exoplanetary science to help us improve our understanding of planetary system, planet evolution, etc. And as I said earlier, it's really important because this understanding has been based for centuries on one unique sample, the solar system. I mean, think about it. <laughs> it's like trying to predict the outcome of an election asking one citizen. Yes, we have quite a few planets, but these are just coming out of you know, the same formation process around the same kind of star. To give you an idea, over the 3,500 planets we've found over the past um, 20 years, we found planets free-floating in the Milky Way without star. We found planets with multiple stars like Kepler-16b. Among the 3,500 planets found, one of them, 
J1407b has 37 rings, 200 times the extent of Saturn's ring. So big that if Saturn had such ring, it would be bigger than the moon in the sky and you would be able to see it by naked eye. We found planets being pulled apart, dying around the star. That's how much diversity we found looking elsewhere. And so TRAPPIST-1, beyond being the opportunity to start searching for signs of habitability, signs of life beyond the edge of our own system, really is the opportunity to start revisiting our understanding of planetary system. This star TRAPPIST-1 is an ultra-cool dwarf star. And that means that it is the type of star that is the most frequent in our galaxy. And it has not formed just one, two, three, four terrestrial planets. It has formed seven, meaning that the archetypical, the stereotypical terrestrial planet might as well be one of these rather than what we've seen in our own solar system, Venus, the Earth, or Mars. Now think about it. If one of them were to be habitable or inhabited, the pale blue dot will actually be a rare thing compared to them. So this is how much our perspective is changing through the study of planets outside our solar system. Now I want to wrap up with this. It really is a new age for space exploration. These vantage points that, that we are about to gain will require a lot of effort over the next generation. Efforts ranging from, you know, inside an expertise of engineers to help us design the key facilities well suited for this kind of development. Biologists to help us understand what actually is a biosignature, a science of life. Geophysicists to help us you know, know what kind of planet are these. Are they rocky like the Earth? How much fraction of water do they have? Do they have ocean? If so, how deep? Thousand kilometers deep based on the density they appear to have? Sure, but what does that mean for the climate, the kind of life that there is there? So there really is a lot to be done, even so we won't be able to travel to this place yet. And a lot of growth can come from them through our understanding of planet formation, habitability, and also maybe live consciousness through them. So let's find out what is our place in the universe, thanks to this planet well beyond the edge of our own system. Thank you. Right, it looks like we have time for a little bit of Q&A, and there's nothing more painful than passing a microphone at a Q&A. God, I hate that. Luckily, we have this. So who has a question? Question, ready? Go, catch it. <laughs> Give it back to them. Okay, where's the next question? You throw it to them. <laughs> this is gonna solve so many problems. <laughs> that works. <laughs> so my question was, so when we find new systems like the Trappist system, yeah. uh, so do we look for uh, signs of life that resemble ours in planet Earth, or do they, does life on like these planets or the systems, if there is, right? Does it have to follow the same model that we have here in planet Earth? Do they have to breathe like oxygen? Do they have to be carbon-based? Can they be like, is it like, mm -hmm. we okay. look for possibilities that they can, they might be methane based or? Yeah, no, that's a great question. But uh, th these are two different things. There's habitability, which really is earth centric. So when we search for signs of habitability, we basically search for signs of liquid water at the surface. But then there is signs of life, and this is really undefined. And people tend to think, even, I mean, I, I actually used to think that there was habitability in the Von diagram, and then Science of life will be right in it. But actually, the way we define science of life is more like an, a negative space. We look at everything that could not be attributed to life, like um, production of O2 by geo geological processes, production of methane, etc. And then we look at what's left, and whatever would be left will be considered as potential science of life biosignature. So we're not trying to map out what we do, and we lay relate whatever life can produce here on Earth to biosignatures. We go the other way around. So there is much more freedom in our definition, or much more open-mindedness in our definition of what could be a biosignature than there is in what is habitability. So we, we way less Earth-centric in, in that regard. Next question. Throw it, throw it! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> um, hi. 
Hi. Uh, my question is about Trappist One. Mm -hmm. The dwarf star, you know, um, and excuse me, the seven orbit planets orbiting it. It seemed that at every at some given time, a part of the planet would be completely covered by another one. So that means like the temperature would vary from very, very low to maybe like a normal temperature. Could you talk more about that? Uh, so yeah, so um, what is going on for, what is most likely going on for, for this planet, it's just the beginning, so we, we don't know yet. What is most likely going on is that they are so close to their star that they are what we call tidally locked. Like the moon is with the Earth, these planets are always showing the same face to their star. Meaning that for some of them, at least, there should be a permanent day side and a permanent night side. So the temperature from the substellar point, the point that's really just in line with the star, to the night side should change significantly. Now, it will mean that it will lead to completely different climates, circulation regime, etc. It will also mean that uh, the sky is all, uh, the star is always at the same position in the sky. So it is a completely different type of planet, type of climate that we experience here on Earth and on the other planet in our solar system. Yet they could be habitable, they could harbor liquid water either on their whole surface or on their limb. We'll see what, what, what is actually going on there in the next you know, 10 to 25 years, and that is what is exciting. It's completely different, but it is within reach. Um, so, probability and outcome um, makes TRAPPIST easy to find because of a 20-day orbit. What if it's a 20-year orbit? Do you have the commitment to stay low, uh, focused on a star where that, that planetary orbit is so long? No. So, um, that's a good question. If, if it's a 20-day orbit, the planets are far enough for us to use other techniques to detect them. So when it's close, the probability of transiting is relatively high. You know, the inclination of the pl planetary plan can be anything. But if it's close enough, then the projection of the plan on the, on the star is, is just significantly higher. If it's that far, you use what we call direct imaging. And what you try to do, you try to block the star using a coronagraph or something like the star shade that Professor Seeger is helping to develop here at MIT to block the star and then reveal the planets around it. So depending on the configuration of the system and the type of planets you're looking for, you use different um, detection technique. So this planet will not be well suited for direct imaging because they are so close to their star. But if you look for planets with a much longer orbital period, like 20 years, then you use different technique to review them and study them. There was a question here in the front. Safety. <laughs> uh, I guess my question is, or kind of two questions embedded in inside each other. Um, you talked about finding life, right? But you never really said specifically what it is that determines whether or not there is life. You we just kind of have a bunch of measurements. And yeah. Whatnot, but what actually is the key thing? Mm -hmm. um, and <coughs> attached to that, does the distance matter? Like, if we find an exoplanet that's really cool, but it's like a million light years away, is that even worth it? Is that... Like, what's the point if it's so far Good. away we can't? No, they, so, two great questions. Um, first, to go back to the question of what is life, um, as I said before, what is life is, is, is really undefined at this stage, and what are signs of life even worse. So we're really working on it. Um, here at MIT, we have quite a few. So Professor Seeger is helping with this, but quite a few of other faculty are committed to the question to define what is a Banya signature, what is a sign of life, because at this stage, it's a huge question mark. So when we observers are going to come and describe, OK, this is what we find in the atmosphere of this planet, uh, could you help us understand if yes or no there is a sign of life? It would, be a c it would be really important at that point to have a clear list of what is or isn't a biosignature and the probability associated with that. Obviously, if we find signs of complex um, molecules, I don't know if CFC will count at this stage, but the, m the more complex the molecule is, the more unbalanced the atmosphere is, the higher the likelihood that there is a biomass supporting this uh, desequilibrium behind it. Um, that's one. Then if you move to complex signs of life, uh, complex signals such as, I mean, I don't want to go back to contact and Judy Foster, but 
maybe you know, close to this, at that point you can get different level of um, confirmation that there is a biomass and potentially the advancements of that biomass. Now, uh, the other question which relates to what's the point, um, in my opinion, the point is that at this stage, really, humanity needs to gain, well, to move beyond the cradle, really. Get this different perspective on what is life, what, what are planets, and what is our position in all this complex system. So I think what is great through the search for life beyond us, the search for other habitats, is to gain these different perspectives that we can leverage to move a tiny bit, increase, grow up, gain a different level of conscientiousness. So in that context, I think it's really good. We won't be able to travel there soon, which might be a good thing, because we might need first to sort out what's going on on this stage, uh, so we don't spread our you know, childish behavior too, too far away. So it's good. It can allow us to just move away, get different perspective, but also a different vantage point on this pale blue dot, and act differently. So the molecules you were talking about, hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, I didn't see anything about oxygen. Is oxygen harder to find, or what, what's the possibility for free oxygen? So, um, yeah, oxygen is, is harder to find because of the O2, the O2 molecule doesn't have much uh, absorption band. It has like very strong lines, but it is too simple to have nice, big absorption features. However, you can look for signs of ozone, for example. Now, one, one misconception is that people tend to, um, I didn't mean for you, <laughs> I mean, people tend to focus on oxygen only, but oxygen only isn't actually a sign of, of, of life, of biomass. It's, it will be oxygen combined with traces of methane and carbon dioxide that, that will make up for proper biosignature. So, to search for signs of oxygen, we'll probably look for indirect signs, such as a nice big uh, signature of ozone combined with any other th uh, any, anything else around. Um, but yeah, it is, a, it is slightly more complicated to find O2, unless you use, as I showed before, the extremely large telescope, and then you can really leverage these things through the big collecting area. Then last question, uh, maybe not. Uh, just behind, all right. We've been hearing about this star in the news which has irregular dips in its brightness. Uh, I think it's called Tabby Star. Um, I was wondering, so like the media automatically jumps to the idea that there's some sort of an alien mega structure around it. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if you have any sort of, you know, other ideas to what the irregular dips could be and what are your thoughts on it in general? Um, <laughs> so I'm going to be very lame. I don't. I'd, honestly, I don't know. Um, at this stage, I think it's it's it is tantalizing. It's really exciting to move to these to move to these theories. But as I just showed with these different exotic planets we found, <laughs> there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot that we still have to learn. So before jumping to such conclusion, I think it's good to really investigate all the other alternative, including the unknown alternative uh, that could be behind this kind of uh, irregular dip. Um, so we'll see. Time, patience. <laughs> it's happening quickly, but we still need a few years to make sure that we have tackled everything adequately before drawing these kind of ex uh, exciting conclusions. And then there was questions on this side. I can, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Thank you. Good save. Um, what's the radiation behavior of these class M stars? Because these planets are so close yeah. that they could, if they flare a lot, they could be just totally baked. Although they're tidally locked, so maybe around the terminator, or on, just on the dark side, there's some refuge. But uh, again, if this star is just sending out flares, they're so close, they're, they potentially could be... So we've, we've placed constraint on the, on the UV radiation of, of Trappist-1, and it's actually relatively quiet. So that's, that's step one. Step two, the one key factor will be the strength of the magnetic field. Step three will be the density of the atmosphere. And if these planets appear to be, as we think they are, uh, volatile rich, meaning they could have you know, a thousand kilometer deep ocean, then you can actually sustain, replenish an atmosphere, keep it very thick, and then you can have habitable, habitable condition on them. So yes, you're right, definitely. Uh, but it's a huge question, like it's a big question point, and we'll see what, what there is, how it unfolds. Uh, but this is a very important factor, yes, the activity of these stars. 
Got to move on? Joe, toss it here.